Welcome to Sounding Board, a production of Seroptimist International of Novato, whose mission it is to improve the lives of women and girls through programs leading to social and economic empowerment. I'm Freda Kaplan, and my guests today are Pamela Taylor and Nancy Holt Gannis, who were Pan Am stewardesses. The mystique of Pan Am has long outlived the airline itself, which shut down in 1991. Pan Am, like the Orient Express, was an emblem of romantic travel. The stewardesses had to embody charm and capability. They were pioneering women. And we have much more to talk about than just charm and capability. So Nancy, what made Pan Am unique? I think it was the first global airline and the only global airline to my knowledge that traveled to all continents and really charted, charted the courses um, for future airlines. And Juan Tripp, the founder, I th was really instrumental in creating the first of uh, prop jets, of crossing oceans, of leading to the jet age, navigation equipment. Uh, he was in advance of the military and the government. and was truly the pioneer in every way to make commercial aviation a reality. Uh, the first flights, of course, were often used for the military or transporting mail, but he really saw the possibility of taking everyday people on trips across the ocean. Um, and his belief was that bringing people together through aviation would make for a more peaceful world. I'm not sure his dream became a reality, but that was the, the hope that um, as people learn to know each other and understand, there would be more tolerance and appreciation for different cultures. How you say that, um, how the routes were chosen were unique. How is that? Um, he really. Uh, in fact, when Africa first opened up, for example, um, Pan Am was the first airline to really create the opportunity for other airlines to come in and other people to travel by building the runways, by uh, building the hotels. In fact, the intercontinental hotels were created by Pan Am in order to establish uh, places for people traveling to stay where there were no hotels previously. Um, he charted uh, routes in ev on every single continent, even Antarctica. Was the uh, Pan Am was the first to land. It wasn't a regular run, but he, he <laughs> bringing uh, supplies and scientists and researchers to Antarctica. Um, I think what was unique is that the crews were from all over the world, the, the cabin crews, the stewardesses, the stewards, and that was to uh, meet the language requirements that would be necessary to communicate with different cultures, having a sense of world geography and uh, money exchange. And uh, he saw it as a quasi-diplomatic corps that could handle any difficult situation on uh, halfway around the world f uh, from the base of operations. And I don't think any other airline operated like that. I think that he trusted his crews to have the resources and the intelligence and the capabilities to handle any dangerous situation that would arise. And they would arise. I mean, it was, um, there was new territory. There were changing governments. There were changing, um, uh, social economic conditions and things could turn on a dime. And you wouldn't have the ability, as you do today, to immediately communicate back to, to home base, mm -hmm. what do we do? He just assumed that the crews that he put together would have the ability to think for themselves and think on the spot and be resourceful. And that created an incredible opportunity, particularly for young women. Um, to be pioneers in this new world that was opening up to everybody. Pam, um, we hear pretty often that it was um, 
different for women in the industry than for the men and that stewardesses had to retire at certain points. Um, is that true for Pan Am? I think in the early years they may have had a, a ruling where you could only fly for so many years, but I started in 1964 and the only restriction was is that you could not uh, be pregnant. But uh, if you were found pregnant, then you were let go. But you were allowed to be married. And so. the, the pay was equal for men and women, which is, was very important yes, in those that's days. Yes, that's true. That's true. And, uh, and for a while during my career, we were at the top 3% of women's salaries when we formed our own union. The uh, flight attendants went ahead and formed their own union, and then we were at the top of the pay scale. But then things changed, and then unions were bashed, and they continued to have a union, but it just wasn't the same. And Pan Am required stewardesses to be able to speak an additional language besides English, which um, may be a difference between flight attendants now and back in the day uh, with Pan Am. Uh, what kinds of uh, people did become the... Well, when you uh, speak of, of crew members today, you think of many of them as being domestic, which was nothing like international travel. We didn't fly anywhere in the States except Hawaii and Alaska. And so we were completely overseas, so we needed languages for the world. And many of the uh, f uh, many of the stewardesses spoke three, four, five languages apiece. Many of them came from small countries that were surrounded by other countries with languages that they needed to learn at, when they were young. Uh, we we had most of the Americans had a second language. But we weren't comprised of mainly Americans. I think we had very few Americans. When I started flying my class, we had a couple of uh, Finnish women and Swedish, uh, Japanese, uh, Hungarian, and uh, a couple of Asian women. But I think it only comprised of about 20% Americans at that time. That was uh, that added to the uniqueness of Pan Am because we were the only airline that flew all over the world to all continents. We had this very diverse um, uh, group of uh, stewardesses and stewards, as we were called in those days, and that made it far more exciting to meet the language requirements because America was isolated. They did call on. Uh, uh, girls, uh, gals and guys from all over the world. Um, and you had to pretty much, uh, I, would, I would say because America was isolated in those days, uh, to meet the, stand, the language qualification, you had to pretty much have a college education and have had, had some exposure through travel or education or family to mm -hmm. other languages. And we also had a, a language lab that if you weren't proficient in your language, you could attend the language lab for six months while you were flying, and then you were, then you were tested. We had a Dr. Pateur in New York who spoke 13 languages, and he was the one who did most of the testing. Oh. I think the biggest challenge for Americans is that you, could, you may have studied in college or in high school, but not having the exposure, the accents were not um, perfect. And so Dr. Batur would bring you into the language lab and work with you on yes. your pronunciations, particularly uh, for the emergency announcements or the, uh, because when the announcements were given, you'd often have two, three, four languages spoken by the flight attendants for the passengers, because in those days, it wasn't so common for people from other countries to speak English. And so it was, it was really necessary to have those other languages. And uh, it was also a time when travel was uh, rather exclusive. It was unique, and there were not private jets. So you really carried 
heads of states and, and celebrities and uh, dignitaries. Uh, and oftentimes the first class section was greater than economy. So there was that incredible requirement to have that global consciousness, global knowledge, and be comfortable being a sort of diplomat with all different types of people in all different economic strata because there would be the immigrants coming for the first time would be mm -hmm. terrified and needed assistance and guidance. And there would be those who would be so confused about um, where they were going, coming and going, not just to the States, but people that we were taking to foreign countries at the time. And there would be a, a, a necessi there was the necessity of being aware of the different customs. For example, if you were getting off the plane in Dar es Salaam, you had to be aware that it was a Muslim country. And so while we had short uh, skirts at our knee level, um, bare legs were not to be exposed. So you would have a wrap that we would put it on and be conscious and respectful of the customs in that country so that you wouldn't create any kind of diplomatic faux pas uh, as a representative of the U.S. And the other thing that I think was unique about Pan Am is that we were truly respected um, as employees. And we also, in turn, respected our company because they looked after us. And we were, as a result, given the opportunity to choose our own trips we could, in, you did it by seniority, but the fact that everybody wanted to see as much as they could of the world, it, you could pretty much get what you wanted, maybe not the first shot, but eventually. Everybody could travel anywhere they wanted. We were taken care of, and what we didn't have in salary, we had in perks and per diem, and we were treated um, really as first-class citizens uh -huh. with the best hotels, mm -hmm. the transportation, the food, the, and where we went, we represented a certain ideal of possibilities in the world, and therefore people looked to us as a lifeline, either helping them escape dangerous situations or bringing in supplies that they didn't have or making it accessible uh, where uh, there was, um, you know, whether it was medical supplies or food or shelter or helping them escape to um, an, a better life. And so we s had both that sense of responsibility and sense of excitement and possibility of, of what we were doing. And that's why I think Pan Am also created many, many charitable connections with World Wings International, which supports care. Um, I think the Tom Dooley Foundation grew mm -hmm. out of... And then each each um, sector, we have World Wings around the world, and then each group has their own charity. They give half of the funds to care and half of the funds to their own charity. What charity is um, the Bay Area? Sen well, Marin is Senior Access. Oh. Yes. So. Very nice. Are there other unique qualities to that job that you would like to talk about? Well, we weren't working every single day. We worked about 12 to 14 days a month. And as Nancy said, Pan Am took very good care of us. If we were away on a holiday, they would have a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner at the hotel and of course everyone would go and we had travel benefits we could fly free anywhere and in those days we could often fly first class so and we had plenty of time for travel I think if you what in retrospect was amazing to me is here we were young girls right out of college and if you looked at the opportunities available to young women yes. at that time, mm -hmm. it was teacher, nurse, secretary, um, which are noble professions, but they aren't necessarily 
the most exciting. And if you're presented with the opportunity to go off and see the world, it was truly um, an adventure of a lifetime. And it was to have that freedom and responsibility, you know, all, uh, halfway around the world, and to know that if there was a crisis, it was up to you and you could rise to the occasion, that was incredibly empowering. It was incredible. Um, I'm not sure we were conscious of it at the time, but it was so liberating in so many ways to have that freedom, that responsibility, that opportunity um, to see the world and discover things. It was an education beyond anything mm -hmm. one can imagine. And I think when I look back, it was probably the most exciting period of my life. And, you know, I've done many and things. And I've heard but that from many, many women who flew a few years or whatever. But also we were in a place that we were watching history being made. Both in the air and on the ground. Yes, uh, but especially on the ground when uh, mm. so many countries would be under martial law. We would still be going in. We went into Iran to the very, very end. Hmm. And Pan Am was still flying into Cuba after Castro and, and uh, Che Guevara were um, uh, in charge. In fact, Pan Am started in, with flights to Cuba. Oh. And uh, now, now they're back with flights <laughs> to Cuba just for the employees. You know, was oh. the flight Pan Am took uh, the press corps into China with Nixon? They were the first to go into the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. Um, mm -hmm. They were, they were there. They were witnesses to history, and the crews were able to be part of that, which and, was incredible. and even the red and pink countries. We would go in. I took the chairman into Burma in the '60s, or maybe it was the early '70s, but. All the heads of state used Pan Am because it was the most, uh, the safest airline. And I remember the chairman brought along his whole entourage, his bodyguard, and when we landed in Rangoon, we put the flags outside the pilot's windows and taxied up. And uh, that was his, his airplane. He was using it as his personal airplane. And he was the head of Burma? Yes, yes, he was the one who overthrew. Ansu's father. Oh. One of the things I don't think many people know is Pan Am was the official White House, um, handled the official White House press corps right up until its demise. Yes. And that's when it went, it was turned over to the military. But before that, it was Pan Am and Pan Am crews that took the press everywhere the president went with Kennedy in Berlin, with Kennedy in um, Dallas. Sadly, they were the ones who had to bring everybody back. And mm -hmm. so that being that close to what was happening in the world in real time was extraordinary. And I, I remember learning as much from the press that we carried in the stories that nobody knew about. And that was the, the first realization of what a distorted perspective we uh, often have of the world, mm -hmm. that um, the truth always can't be told, nor is it. And there are propaganda machines everywhere. Um, and it was also the first time I realized the power of our country to do good, but sometimes to do bad. And the fact that the US was involved in deposing freely elected leaders in countries um, that we wanted to control. And I think that was quite a, a shock mm -hmm. um, because it did dispel some of the myths and the sense of uh, greatness. And you saw that America could be both the shield and the sword. And um, that, that knowledge was both, as I said, empowering, but sometimes disillusioning. And uh, you saw that because you were actually there. The rest exactly. of us read it 
or saw it or, on TV or saw, it kept or, from us. Or, yes, yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, I was, I remember when I learned about um, the fact that the CIA had been involved in overthrowing free, you know, democratically elected governments, and I saw the result of it on the ground in the places we flew, and it was completely denied back at home. That was really discouraging and shocking to me, which is actually why I wanted, after I stopped flying, I wanted to return to graduate school and become a journalist with the, mm -hmm. the naive belief that I could tell the truth <laughs> 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 of what I saw, but realizing there are censors mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, Just um, as we see today yeah, in Pakistan and all, the, the, uh, mi all through the Middle East, especially in Pakistan, the good, the good people there, how many of them have been slaughtered. Mm -hmm. I think you realize one of the things that touched me is the majority of people all over the world are good people. There are few, a few bad people, but there are a few bad people everywhere, including our own country. And sadly, whether it's, you know, whatever the, one's agenda is, the perception that somehow anything other than us is to be feared is, I think, to cause harm to all of us. Because if, if we cannot see what, that we have more in common, more um, goodness than evil, I think it's self-destructive. Mm -hmm. and, and I think our, those who have the power to communicate that have a responsibility to communicate the truth. And sadly, it gets distorted and manipulated because they have um, interest in maintaining that ignorance. And that's mm -hmm. unfortunate. And I, th I think Pan Am opened our eyes to so many things that you know, I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. And I don't think anybody flying today will have quite that same experience because oh, there yeah. is no global airline mm -hmm. like that today. And it's a different world. It's a mm -hmm. different world. When we were traveling, it wasn't, uh, we it was didn't no have security. any fear, fear of our lives. There wasn't any security on the airplane even. So it was just, we were safe wherever we were free to go on our own all over the globe. It doesn't mean there weren't hijackings and dangerous situations because mm -hmm. there were. There were four um, planes blown up um, on September 6, 1970. And people, four hijackings in, out of Amsterdam on September 6, 1970. Mm -hmm. Three of them were blown up. And the one that wasn't was El Al. Yes, <laughs> and we were given, uh, the flight attendants were given three minutes to get everyone off, and they did it in 90 seconds, didn't they? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the reason that the, seven, the, the very first 747 was hijacked in 1970 out of Amsterdam, the other three planes were ordered to go to Jordan, but Pan Am 747 couldn't land there because the runway wasn't big enough. So it was diverted to Cairo, but first it went to Lebanon, where more terrorists could board, uh, board the plane. And as it was going into Cairo, the terrorists laid dynamite throughout the 747 and lit it before it touched down. So when it hit the runway, mm -hmm. the crew was um, told that as soon as they touched down, they would evacuate. But the captain was still taxing, not knowing that they had already started the evacuation. So the purser called up and said, we're evacuating. And they um, got everybody out, I think, in 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. They were but able the, to get the... And it was still moving. Well, no, the, the captain stopped as soon as he realized they were evacuating. But the, the slides were tipping people off of them. And, but everybody got off. They were running from the plane. And in 90 seconds after they got out, uh, or after they touched down, the plane exploded. Mm -hmm. And they thought that the, cap the pilots were stuck in the uh, cockpit, but they had gone out with bungee cords from the cockpit windows. Mm -hmm. And so everybody escaped that. But the world didn't know it because we didn't have 24 hours.
seven news and we didn't have internet and most people today never even know heard heard no, of it. That's true. That's true. Well, and, but but the hijackings only started in the mid seventies, I think, because no, in nineteen sixty eight. Really in sixty eight. Oh yeah, in 68. Oh yes. Well, I remember that used to be the worst fear mm -hmm. was a hijacking, and when you think of what's happening now. <laughs> hijacking would be pretty mild. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think that that's why um, uh, one of our friends um, was on one of the uh, attempted hijackings in Rome. Yes. The one that was just horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and she happened to look out and see a jeep coming across the tarmac with four guys with um, the, uh, the Palestinian headgear mm -hmm. with machine guns. And she alerted the captain um, right away, but they charged up and, you know, they machine gunned down passengers and crew. And then they threw a, a, a hand grenade. hand grenade into for the first class section. She the, survived, but yeah. was, she quit after that. She was so traumatized. The yeah. captain's wife was in first class. She oh. was killed. Oh Most of the passengers were yeah. killed in first class. And most people have no idea about this because of the way the, the, there wasn't the access to information. Right, right. Mm, and we used to get information at the hotels on a ticker tape. I can remember getting oh. up with her pickup and then going out a little early and checking all the news when I was down in the South Pacific or wherever I was because you didn't get the news any other way. Well, I look forward to talking more to you, but for now, uh, we'll be leaving. So I want to thank you, Pam, and you, Nancy, for joining us on Sounding Board. And I want to thank our Seroptimus crew and our engineer, Leon Johnson, for helping us with the production of Sounding Board. You can see archived Sounding Board shows on the Seroptimus International of Novato website, which is seropnovato.org. There are at least a hundred of them there, um, links to them, and they're all very interesting. We want to thank especially the Buck Institute for Research on Aging for allowing us to use this wonderful studio, and we want to thank you for watching.